It is day 10 of November. That means that we are our third done, and today's prompt is maze, so I thought why not just make a playable maze game in Blender. By the way, this November video is sponsored, finally, we're, we're doing it. Sponsored by Squarespace, we're gonna talk about that later. And the idea that I'm going for is I'm going to make a maze, and you know, maybe it's gonna be complicated, maybe it's not. And I think the way I want the player to play is they'll start in the bottom left corner, and they are to go to the top right corner. And the way we're gonna control this is we are gonna have an empty that you just drag around, pretty much as simple as that. <laughs> and I'm gonna go two-dimensional for this one. Make a integer parameter, since I think I want to have a one-by-one one maze, and I'm going to bring this up significantly to something like 20 by 20. And we're going to tell Blender to calculate like a random path from one to the other. This is where the shortest edge path node comes in. We need that node and edge path to selection, is it lets us define a end vertex and a start vertex, and it's going to find a path between those. Okay, enough theory. We're going to check where the index, let's say, is equal to zero, which should be the bottom left corner. And to get the top right corner, corner, I want to see where the index is equal to, well, let's think. The index starts at zero, and then I believe it goes vertically to one, two, all the way up to 19, because again, we have 20 by 20 grid, and the indexing starts at zero. Then over here, it's 20. It goes up the second column, then the third column, fourth column. The top right vertex is going to be the largest index, which you can think of as just 20 squared minus one. Take the power of two, and then subtract one from that, and we want to see where the index is equal to this. Make it your start vertex, which one you make end and start doesn't really matter. I'm going to delete geometry by the selection, which initially looks like it does nothing. But if I disable and enable this, you're seeing it's actually getting rid of like this right angle because Blender is saying that is the shortest path from here to here. But you know, that's very easy. I want it to be more randomized. And this is where the edge cost comes in. The way Blender calculates the shortest path is it goes edge by edge by edge. Each one has a distance or in other words, a cost to traverse it. And if we were to randomize this cost, it wouldn't really be a very predictable path. Either way, take your edge cost, and we are going to make this a random number. But when we enable our delete, you can see all of a sudden we get this nice jagged path. And as I change the seed here, we're going to get different paths, but it's kind of like twice the thickness it should be. And you might think, okay, change this to edge, so it's deleting edges, but now we get this funky thing. It's not obvious what we're supposed to do. So I'm going to define this maze as a series of like instances can use a cube. And as I bring the size of this cube down, now we're getting a path that is only like a single block or single single unit tall. And now all we need to do is kind of cut away random paths so you have a chance of getting it wrong. So I'm going to add a random contribution, set that to boolean, and you see as we play around with this probability, you're going to get rid of points. But first of all, there is a glaring issue where if you kind of travel this path, you could actually exit at where the end point is not. In other words, there's multiple exits. And that's because our boundary is sometimes dissolving. We have our original grid, and we only want to keep the points or the edges that are on the very boundary. Remember, this grid is always is going to be one by one. In other words, I can separate our geometry and that rule is going to be we are going to look at the position and if x is equal to one or or we have two conditions, the y is equal to one. Actually, we do need to take an absolute value here before we do that. That way negative one is mapped to one. So we're seeing if it's equal to one. In either condition, what we want to do is we want to add these together, which is saying one is OK, the other is OK or both of them. And that's going to be our selection. And if we view this now, you're going to see, OK, it doesn't work. And that means we made a mistake. Remember, the size of x and y is equal to 1. I'm talking as if I didn't direct you here, that it has a horizontal and vertical diameter of 1. But the radius, so to speak, is actually 0.5. I'm going to make this equal to 0.5, and we've adequately isolated it. So all we need to do is join these together, but we have an issue where our two like start and end points are again filled in. What we need to do is we got to make this boundary, but it has to be bigger than the maze. And we were to kind of like scale them up in some sense, then this would work exactly. Now you're going to see that these points don't really like line up exactly. So just visually, I can subdivide the section, which is going to add more points. But visually, it's going to look like a continuous boundary. And the only issue I'm seeing here is the user always knows to go to the top right corner. So if I make it like one of these other corners arbitrarily, then that might make it a bit more confusing. The top left corner is just going to be the index minus one. You can see it's going from the top right to the top left corner. Now the bottom right corner might be a bit more complicated, but we basically take this top right corner corner and move down a little. We take this and then subtract away. Maybe it's like 19. Let's try that with another switch. Okay, that seems to be correct. And by the way, the reason I picked 19 is because a 
our resolution is 20. I'm going to take 20, subtract one, and connect that here. So in other words, we now have a way to pick any corner that we want. So I can use a random value set to Boolean. Our ID should be constant so that this is only generating a single number. Connect this to the switch such that when we change this, it's going to change the paths. And then we are going to make a second one, but offsetting the seed by one and connect that to the second switch. So now we should be able to go on any path. And the last thing we need to do is kind of make start and end points. But remember, we have our start and our end points right here. So all I need to do is use those two instance, basically our flags for the beginning and the end. So I am going to combine these with an addition. This is going to be our selection for our initial grid. And maybe we can have our flags be something different, like a sphere, join these together, make that substantially smaller. Okay, so now we have our start and end point. And finally, we should give these different materials so you can tell them apart. So our end material can be green because you finished. Our start material can be red because you're starting. And our maze can be white. So in general, this is going to have start, but we are going to overwrite it with end, given that it's the uh, second instance. And this might be convoluted, but it's an easy way to do this. I can store named attribute for our end index. I'm going to call this attribute end, and it's going to have a value of one. We're going to use a named attribute, going to be the end attribute. Now this is overriding both of them, which tells me it's not working. And I think it's because we have a point attribute instead of a instance attribute. We could fix that, or we could just realize the instances and call it a day. So after all of this, there's actually only two parameters we care about. And it's obviously going to be the which corner thing, and also how many edges we're getting rid of. And in between is where you get a tiny bit of challenge. Control G to make it a node group. I mean, what we can do is we can set the maximum to 0.5, which should be as complicated as it can be, because otherwise it's either deleting too much or too few. Okay, so now it's working, which is kind of giving me a dark orange vibe. I don't know. That's just what I'm feeling. Now, I know what you've been thinking this entire time. This game's fucking easy. And that's where the kicker is. Our final thing is making this game a bit harder. And we're going to make it playable. We're going to have an empty, and you can think of this as your player. You kind of use your cursor to navigate. But to make this difficult, let's go to the render tab. And even better is we dim the lights. I'm going to add in a light source, which has to be slightly above on the Z axis. This I'm going to parent to our empty. So now you see we kind of have a flashlight thing, but again, it's too easy to see what's going on. We want to make sure to use a custom distance so the light cannot go too far. And suddenly, the maze game is actually a game. I mean, the next step is kind of like increasing the number of like points so that, you know, it has more difficulty. But let's actually make the resolution customizable as well so that we can make this substantially harder. I'm going to take 20, which is our initial value, divided by our resolution, is I can bring this all the way over to where we're instancing our like game cubes and all that. Not to be confused with Nintendo, we're going to connect this to the scale. And when this is equal to 20, it does nothing. But when we bump it up to 40, all of a sudden everything is scaled correctly, I guess, except for the border. But for now, we're going to leave that be. And you can see how quickly this game becomes like harder, where you can also make it harder by bringing down the view distance. So I'm calling that a complete game. And there we go. We did it. So as always, the blend file is going to be in the description. Join Patreon and get 30 files this month. Ne never has this been done before. And that's it. Okay, so thank you for watching my tutorial, a tutorial sponsored by Squarespace. Finally, November is going big, but Squarespace is a website that makes websites. Very customizable with templates, no HTML or anything like that. And here are three features that make it great. First of all, you get analytics, so you know who is going to your website. Second of all, you get a content library, which you can think of as kind of like a drive in the cloud. It's going to save your images, videos, any asset that you used for your website. And then finally, and this is the best feature, obviously, you can just drag around squares to customize your website. It used to be much harder where you had to learn to code and do all this stuff. So head over to Squarespace and make your website. And when you are ready to take that thing live, there's a link in the description. Click it and you save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.